This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everyone, uh, and good morning if you are joining from other, other parts of the world. And then uh, welcome to today's session on women's work in South Asia, season two. Uh, as you all are aware, South Asia's average female labor force participation is much lower compared to uh, several other parts in the world. And this project is a second series on women's work in South Asia. The first being organized in May to June last year. And we had featured eminent speakers like Prof. J.D. Ghosh, Prof. Sonal De Desai, Prof. Jimol Unni, Prof. Ashwini Deshpande, Deepa Sinha, and Ramani Gunatilaka. And this is a second series, and we are bringing panel sessions this year on uh, women's work with experts discussing on various aspects of women's work. Today, we have uh, Dr. Shaini Chakravati and Dr. Pallavi Chaudhary. Uh, Dr. Shaini Chakravati is presently working as an assistant professor at Amity University, Noida. She has been working on women and development for the past few years, especially on issues related to women's work. Her core interests have been in areas related to women's economic empowerment by enabling access to labor markets and gendering macroeconomic policies to introduce a gender lens and analyzing public policies using the same. Uh, she completed her PhD from the Jawaharlal Nehru University at New Delhi. Her thesis looked at gen uh, gender wage discrimination in Indian labor markets since 90s. Uh, earlier, she worked with the Institute for Social Studies Trust, the National Institute for Public Finance and Policy uh, on issues on women's empowerment, public finance, etc. And she regularly publishes in several uh, journals and newspapers and magazines. Uh, Dr. Pallavi Chaudhary. Dr. Pallavi Chaudhary is a senior scholar, senior fellow at the National Council for Applied Economic Research, the National Data Innovation Center, NDIC. At NDIC, her recent work has focused on leading experiments related to measurement gaps in income and consumption data and women's time use data. She is also part of, of the core research team of the, the Women Development Survey. Uh, and uh, you know, a very a very glad and very wonderful colleague uh, at, of our India Women Development Survey. And prior to joining at the National Council for Applied Economic Research, uh, uh, Pallavi has taught uh, courses in economics at the Grand Valley State University as a visiting professor. She has a PhD in economics from the University of Wyoming. Uh, now I pass uh, the repeat to my fellow YSCN and organizer, uh, Vasha Gupta, to moderate this session. Uh, over to you, Vasha. You are muted. Hi, everybody. So our today's session on unpaid work and unaccounted work is going to be started by Dr. Shiny. I invite Dr. Shiny to present uh, start her session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Varsha, and thank you for inviting me for this wonderful event. Let me first uh, share my screen. Just give me a minute. Uh, just a minute. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, the title of today's, today's presentation is Measuring Women's Work in India. And I will be speaking about the recent trends in women's work in India by using the official labor force survey data, that is a periodic labor force survey data, and uh, to some extent by uh, time use data of Government of India in 2019. I thought of making it into two parts. And in the first part, I will discuss uh, Indian women who are considered as workers by the official labor force statistics, like those who are employed or working. So what happened to them during the recent years? In the second part, I will be discussing about women who are not considered as workers who are outside the labor force statistics. So, uh, and they are engaged in some kind of unpaid chores. So, what, uh, what, what is the recent uh, trends about their workforce uh, participation or about their work? So, let let me first begin with the first round, the first part. Uh, uh, 
that is uh, uh, that, that, that about women's workforce participation rate. So the recent PLFS 2020-21 reveals two trends uh, rather unexpected for the pandemic period. Uh, first of all, uh, the overall workforce participation. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. First of all, the overall workforce participation rate has increased significantly during the recent time period and it rose to its highest level in the last four years. And secondly, the increase in women, the increase in overall workforce participation rate was entirely driven by, by the increase in rural women's employment. So it is quite contradictory given the economic disruption due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the obvious question comes like, how do we explain the rise in women's workforce participation rate uh, during the COVID-19? So what I did, I tried to explain uh, the workforce participation rate by looking into the what happens in terms of workforce participation rate for different age groups and for different levels of education. So let me first show like uh, workforce participation rate for different age groups. For that, I divided it into two parts. Uh, workforce participation rate for the young, younger age group, that is 15 to 29 years, and workforce participation rate for the older age group, that is 30 to 59 years or age, uh, age, group, age bracket. So uh, what I found that um, age group wise WPL indicates that more women of the 30 to 59 years, that is the older age group, participated in the rural job market uh, from 2017-18 to 2021 compared to the women of the younger yeah your slides are not changing uh, okay it's on the main slide itself Okay, uh, so what I did, I tried to uh, see the, what happens to the workforce participation rate across different age groups and across different educational levels. So the first one is like what happens with the workforce participation rate across different age groups. And I found that uh, like the age group wise WPR, it indicates that more women of the 30 to, 30 to 59 years age group, that is the older age group, they participated in the rural job market uh, from 2017-18 to 2021, compared to the women of the younger age group, that is 15 to 29 years. The next slide, please. Yeah. So education wise WPR shows that the biggest increase in rural women's WPR were seen amongst those with low educational levels. Whereas on the other hand, WPR for women who were graduates and above declined in urban areas during the recent time, that is during the last two years. Next slide, please. please. So I tried to see what uh, what happens at, uh, across different types of employment, ac ac across different activity wise distribution of employment. And for that, I divided it into three ca major categories according to the NSA. So that is the self-employed, the wage employee, and the casual laborers. And I found that a more in-depth review of the data revealed that the entire increase in rural women's WPR is owing to self-employment. And within self-employment, it is more, it's about particularly about own account enterprises, which typically do not involve any higher workers. And after own account employment, it's the second one is the high unpaid helpers where more women participated. Um, and the engagement as own account workers uh, reflects that the nature of work is not opportunity driven, rather it is necessity driven. And the second one that is the unpaid family helpers, within that also it indicates the precarious conditions of women's employment. If, if you see the other two categories, that is the wage employee and the casual laborers, then there has been a significant decline uh, in terms of women's employment in these two categories. Whereas if I uh, talk about uh, men's uh, 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 activity-wise distribution in these three major categories, then there was no significant change in men's category of employment in these three categories over the, uh, f like over the last four years. So next slide. 
Next, uh, I tried to see what happens ac across the different industries uh, distribution of women's employment, and I found that women's employment has increased in agricultural sector, and whereas it has been it has de uh, declined in uh, manufacturing and other services industries. So maybe maybe the increase in um, Women's employment in agriculture uh, in the recent period can be explained by the reverse migration from urban to rural areas due to the pandemic and the subsequent lockdown. So uh, as a last step, I tried to see like what happens in terms of the gender age gap. So next slide. So in terms of gender age gap, I found that the gender age gap as a measure of female age to male age has significantly increased over the last two years. And the increase in gender age gap was more in urban areas compared to rural. And between casual age laborers and regular age employees, the gender age gap was larger for casual age laborers during the pandemic. But uh, during the post-pandemic period, gender age gap has significantly increased for urban regular age employees. So the overall analysis of women who were who are working it suggests that the, like the the unusual finding of rising women's WPR, particularly among rural women during the pandemic period, is almost entirely explained by the. Mm, that they're increasing the self-employment, typically by women with older age groups with low level of education and in the agricultural sector, which is which can be uh, uh, which can indicate uh, about the income effect. That is, the rural women took up low paid informal work to supplement their family income uh, during the period of crisis. So, in the next part, I tried to see what ha this is about. Like what, what happened with the women who were working, but. If you uh, if you see the uh, Indian labor force statistics, then a huge amount of women are outside the labor force statistics. So what happened with them during the recent period? So next slide, please. Okay. So if if you can see that in uh, 2021, almost 46 percent rural women and 58 percent of urban women, they were outside the purview of labor force statistics. That means they were neither considered as workers, they were neither learned, they, they were even not looking for any kind of employment. So, but they were engaged in different kinds of unpaid activities, be it the only domestic chores. Yeah, the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this one. Thank you. So, no, no, the previous one. Yeah. So, uh, be it the only domestic chores like cooking, cleaning, taking care of the children and elderly person in the household, which is defined by the only domestic chores. And the second one is domestic and allied activity, which basically includes bringing water for household uses, collecting fuel, firewood for household consumption. So, these are the two activities on which the labor force survey data uh, divided uh, the number of, the, divided the proportion of women who were involved in uh, different kinds of unpaid chores. And if you see, like, within these two categories, that is the only domestic chores and domestic and allied activity, more women, the majority of them were involved, like 29% in rural areas and 51% in urban areas were involved in only domestic activity, like this cooking, cleaning, these types of activity. But this is about the, from the official periodic labor force survey, but in terms of any official labor force survey, we know that the, uh, the detail estimates in terms of the, in terms of women's participation rate and time spent by women, uh, these are not available from the official labor force survey data. And that's why I took help from the last available time of survey data to, um, uh, to uh, give a brief overview of, about, of, uh, of the detailed estimates of women's participation rate and time spent in different kinds of unpaid activity. And that's what uh, I use the All India Time Use Survey data 20, 2019. So the next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, this one. Thank you. So according to the TUS 2019, women were primarily found responsible for the domestic chores. As you can see, that only 21% women are working in contrast to 69% men. The orange one, the orange, uh, you can see. Whereas the, from, from the blue column, you can see that uh, near about all women, like almost all of them, 94%, they are involved in unpaid caregiving and domestic activities in India during 2019. 
<clears throat> if you see the right hand side uh, diagram, the time spent by men and women in these different types of unpaid and paid activities, then on average women spend daily six and a half hours on this unpaid activity, whereas men spend daily two and a half hours. Now, a further, if we further break up uh, these un different types of unpaid household chores, then like there are broadly two categories, like only household chores and then this uh, taking care of the children and elderly person. So let me show you that one. So the next slide, please. Yeah. So participation <coughs> rate in terms of different unpaid domestic services uh, further breakup shows that this is a rural urban division. Uh, so around 87% of women are involved in preparing food for all members of the household. And near about 72%, they were involved in managing, cleaning, and mop mopping of the household on their own. And around 48% of them were involved in washing, drying, and ironing clothes of all the household members. <clears throat> and if we see the time spent by women in this um, three major activities. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, the previous, yeah, this one, this one, yeah. <coughs> the next. Yeah, this one, thank you. So if we see they spend more than six hours daily in all of these three major activities. <coughs> so, um, now, if I further try to see like what happens, what what's the women particip men and women participation rate in terms of different care work and uh, time spent in this care work activity. So let me show you that. Next slide. Yeah, participation of men and women in different unpaid caregiving uh, services. It basically uh, in, uh, indicates that a more nuanced gender differences we, we can observe in terms of spending. Uh, time in unpaid child care work because we can see women they are the primary child care give child give, caregivers because they are mostly involved in giving the physical care to the children they and they spend more than two hours daily in the physical care of the children such as feeding cleaning etc whereas men <coughs> they are not the um, uh, first uh, they are not the primary caregivers they are mostly um, Spending time in uh, spending their time in meeting and uh, with meeting and arrangement with schools and child care service providers. <coughs> so next slide, please. A state-wise analysis of the time spent in unpaid care also shows that the disparity in the care work undertaken by men and women. <coughs> Sorry. And it is highest in the Western and, <coughs> sorry, it is highest in the Western and Northwestern part of the country. You can see that in almost in all North and Northwestern parts is 10.911, something like that. Whereas in states like Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Nagaland and Goa, they fare better in terms of uh, time spending by women and women in different care services. <coughs> sorry. The right, if you see the right hand side, then time spent by women across different educational qualifications, it shows that women across all educational qualifications, they devoted a greater chunk of their time towards different kinds of unpaid care work than men. So education probably doesn't appear to even the distribution of care work between Indian men and women <coughs> and the disparity remaining as high and sticky across all levels of education. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Statewide ratio of time spent on unpaid care by married individuals, that is women and men, suggests that the, again, Haryana, Rajasthan, they display the highest gender disparity, whereas Goa, Arunachal Pradesh, they fare better. So overall, <coughs> so overall amongst married persons, the eastern states, particularly northeast, shows the best gender distribution of unpaid care work. Now, in my opinion, what I try, what I want to comment is that uh, the skewed distribution of work is often the pivotal cause of time poverty. 
that leaves married Indian women with less, less time to work than compared to, compared to their counterparts. So inadequate care and um, lack of infrastructure, lack of uh, partner and family support may further uh, accentuate the problem and forcing the uh, married women to leave the workforce after marriage and children. So to conclude, the next slide. Uh, the overall increase in women's WPA that we have seen cannot be considered as an improvement in terms of women's employment condition in India. Rather, a further uh, division uh, and detailed investigation reveals the darker side of the bitter truth. So only looking into the increase in women's WPA is absolutely misleading in India and more so during the pandemic period. The first part that we have seen that increase in women's em employment, particularly in the self-employed category. So in terms of some policy, maybe government can think of supporting women startups by providing them tax incentives and uh, easy access to finance. In the second part, the more involvement of women in different kinds of unpaid cares, unpaid services. So what may be the best option, in my opinion, is to universalize the uh, universalized availability of childcare facilities to all women workers, be in the organized or in the unorganized sector, is basically the need of the hour so that they can participate in different kinds of paid activities. So in a nutshell, our macroeconomic policies need to be more gender responsive. And the measures adopted now, in my opinion, must also outlast the COVID-19 pandemic and contribute to mitigate gender inequalities in the long run. So that's it from my side. I hope I am on time, right? Yeah, thank you, Shaini. Yeah, thank we you, are thank nearly you. on time. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I'll just quickly call, uh, call Dr. Pallavi, invite Dr. Pallavi for her session, and then we can take on questions from your presentation for any clarifications or any discussion. Uh, Dr. Pallavi, please. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, unpaid and unaccounted work um, using mostly uh, the NSSO time use data and uh, one of our surveys that we carried out in uh, at NCAR. Um, there are a lot of overlaps with what Shiny just uh, discussed. So I'll sort of briefly go into those areas. So my talk may be a little shorter. Uh, and then we can have, uh, I think, uh, more discussion on this. Um, so why why do we need to talk about uh, unpaid work uh, and unaccounted work? So when we look at the economic welfare, economic well-being, I think the focus uh, in India is focus anywhere is the per capita GDP and employment indicators. But in an economy where, where you have very large informal sector and very low unemployment rates, these are not really the perfect indicators. Um, and that's mainly because women, uh, more women are engaged in informal sector uh, and uh, they don't really have access to social security benefits. They also spend a lot more time on unpaid work. Uh, and this is guided by gendered divisions of labor and which, which is which is which is found in very rigid patriarchal uh, societies uh, it can also stem from inadequate access to infrastructure uh, and a plethora of other uh, reasons um, so the hours that uh, hours of work that women tend to uh, spend on household labor so as such is not counted in countries gdp uh, or the employment figures and so uh, and so, and that's mainly because these are not in the purview of market-oriented work. Uh, so the what and more technical jargon would be system of national accounts. Um, so they're outside the purview, and so they don't really get counted for, and so they're not equally valued. And so, um, as far so, if if I may quote a study by Oxfam. They talked about a systematic transfer of hidden subsidies to the economy. So women are providing certain services, but they don't really count, get counted uh, in terms in GDP. Um, 
So a brief overview of like different kinds of activities. So uh, one is the SNA activities, which consider both paid and unpaid work. The unpaid work can be of different types. It can be uh, work on family farms. So this is still productive work, uh, economic activity uh, where you are producing either for own consumption or like other subsistence ac activities. So these are unpaid market work. So the, uh, where the, the where the household member is working as a helper. Um, and then unpaid to other unpaid work can be uh, those that are involved in domestic uh, chores like free collection of goods, uh, cooking, uh, uh, cleaning and all that sort. And then also care activities, caring for children, sick or elderly or disabled. Um, and these on the other hand, like earlier was productive work uh, these are extended SNA activities because these are not, uh, and these are considered to be not not for not economic activities. Uh, so these are outside the purview of uh, the narrow definition of SNA activities. Uh, and then you have the non-SNA activities, which are learning, social, cultural activities, personal care, and self-maintenance. So uh, when we talk about unpaid work, we can look at both the unpaid economic activities or the unpaid domestic work or, or, or care work. Um, and, so, and each has its own implications in terms of when we talk about uh, not accounting the work that uh, women are engaged in. So um, just a little overview of some of the statistics. Uh, if you look at the NSSO 2019 time use survey, um, which is the first nationwide time use survey that was carried out, we observed that 63% men participated in SNA activities, whereas only 34% women participated in SNA productive activities. This flips when we look at non-SNA activities, which is domestic work or, or care work. So 36% men uh, versus 83% women. Uh, so that's like, uh, not, not only it flips, but a lot, lot more women are engaged in domestic chores or uh, care services. So uh, more than 90%, if you look at the exact statistics of unpaid work, domestic work, uh, then more than 90% women are engaged in the unpaid domestic work. Uh, whereas paid work, uh, and I'm saying paid work, you remember, uh, work can be both unpaid work and paid work, uh, unpaid productive work. So here we're looking at paid work, which is 22% uh, women are engaged. Now, if you look at the, um, like 24 hours in a day, women on average spend about 19% of her daily time in unpaid work. This amounts to 84% of their working hours, uh, whereas men spend only 2.5% of their time in unpaid work. And this amounts to, uh, uh, so, sorry, yeah, and uh, they spend the rest of the time. So like they spend around 80% of their time on paid work. So, uh, if you look at in terms of minutes, uh, women on average across both rural and urban region, they spend more than 300 minutes on unpaid chores compared to 90 minutes uh, by men. And if we compare to other BRIC nations like uh, China and South Af Africa, uh, this, is, uh, this is more than 40% of, of what we see in some of the other countries. Um, Significant cultural variations, which Shiny also talked about, uh, we find more in women engaged in paid work in Southwestern and Central states. However, there is not much difference in terms of unpaid work. So the burden is still the same, uh, burden of unpaid work is still the same in both Northern and, and Southern regions. So uh, this means double the work burden. So you are engaged in paid work, but you are also engaged in, in as much in unpaid work. Uh, so that's double burden of uh, women, women's work. And then we also see some significant caste and religious, uh, mainly caste variation. Um, now, why is why why do we need to focus on women's unpaid work? One is that this prevents women from accessing labor markets uh, because our service sector in, in rural areas, especially it's not as developed. The care services, the care industry is not as developed. Uh, infrastructure access is still limited. 
um, in, in multiple uh, areas. And so that prevents women from also investing in education and skill, skill, uh, skills acquisition. It also has uh, implications for intergenerational transfers in terms of the amount of time women can invest in their children uh, towards enhancing their human capital development. Uh, and a study that I did with uh, Professor Desai actually showed that uh, women who are uh, will, who belong to households that collect uh, fuel or collect like collect fuel from the commons or collect water from outside, they are less likely to. Uh, I mean, children in those households are are, are sort of uh, less likely to perform well in in their studies, and that is uh, that that is mainly because of the extra amount of time that mothers have to spend away from home doing all these different chores. Uh, so poorer marginalized women are more likely to suffer from extreme poverty because they have to engage in all these different kinds of work, like both paid and unpaid, and often in uh, precarious conditions. Now, uh, here's this shows by principal activity status, we see significant variation uh, first, between men and women, uh, it doesn't differ in as much between rural and urban area. The 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 uh, women still tend to spend more time on um, unpaid work compared to men uh, in almost both the regions. But we see that those who are spending, uh, those who are regular salaried work, spend marginally less time in unpaid work compared to those who are working as own account worker um, or helper, they work more so that, so working on family farms allow more flexibility to sort of work on household chores, uh, but it also, these are probably more distress earning. So the earnings potential is probably even, even lesser. So uh, women are also, women also have, tend to have less bargaining power in negotiating uh, their work status and, and what and, and the gender division of labor. Um, here, what I show is engagement in paid versus unpaid work. Uh, it, it's very striking to see the, the differences where we see that higher engagement uh, by men in, in paid work and higher engagement by women, in, in these are the green bars, in domestic work. Uh, so percentage of women who are engaged in uh, domestic work, work, that's 94% in rural areas, slightly lower in urban areas, 89%, uh, and, and much, much lesser for men in, in both urban and rural areas. Um, and, and see, there is, looking at these figures, it, it's obvious that there's a substitution going on between paid and unpaid work, uh, which women suffer from. Um, the, the right column, uh, the right panel diagram shows the average time in hours. Um, obviously that's again, significant more time in uh, paid work by men in both rural and, and urban areas. And women are still working uh, in income generating work, uh, but they're also simultaneously working in, um, Unpaid, they're also engaged in unpaid work, uh, but overall less women are engaged in uh, paid work. Um, here, just a brief look at care services of domestic chores. The, so I focus on more, more, mostly on childcare because that's where the bulk of the care services uh, go, go into. 26% uh, uh, of women are engaged in childcare uh, in, uh, or like overall, like overall, both in rural and urban areas, you see less men obviously are engaged in cooking or cleaning, uh, like around 5% in cooking and 8% in cleaning. It's mostly a women-centric job. Uh, so these are the like very uh, strong social and cultural norms that guide uh, gender division of uh, labor. Now, I won't go into details of that because Shani has talked a lot about those. So I sort of deleted some slides, which I had. But here's something uh, that uh, some of my colleagues at NCER sort of carried out an experiment uh, in 2019, and they looked at, uh, and this is another part of, so now I'm looking at paid work and where uh, 
There can be measurement errors also in uh, capturing what women are engaged in. So, so far you have talked about unpaid care services, unpaid, um, um, unpaid um, domestic chores, but it's also difficult to capture. But, it, it, uh, but the another thing that is very important is looking at uh, what paid activity, what income generating activity uh, women are involved in. Uh, and our findings uh, and the survey and the study was carried, uh, was carried out by uh, Desai, Deshmukh uh, and others. And well, so what they did was they compared between NSS uh, survey and IHTS style uh, survey. And so if you think of like NSS survey, the status based listing like principal activity status where you ask, uh, what have you done over the last 365 days, the, the, the majority of the, of the time, uh, whether you are employed and not employed, uh, and then what kind of activities were you engaged in? Now, if you uh, were working for less than 30, so and, and then if you were working for less than 30 days, it doesn't really get captured at all. Um, most of it, like if you work at least the 30 days, then it can get captured in subsidiary activities. Uh, whereas in IHDS, we tend to uh, give prompts whether households are involved in a variety of activities, uh, and we spell out those activities and then the time spent in each. Um, so there was an experiment, like I said, which we uh, sort of uh, ran in 2019. And the results show that women's work uh, get underestimated a lot in labor force surveys. Uh, about 28% of women were defined as employed by being by status listing method, the NSS method. 33% uh, as per the IHTS method when we include only working on family farm or family business or wage work. Uh, if we add work on animal farms, then the proportion jumps to 44%. Um, so, uh, so, and, and so the very interesting thing, thing why it sort of comes up is what is perceived as work. Uh, so when we ask, when we sort of go to the field and, and ask uh, whether a woman is working, uh, if a woman is working in family farm, and if the question is sort of uh, prompted to any other household member uh, and not explained, then chances are it just doesn't get counted as work because so they are they were working at home. Uh, so a lot of times without these prompts, uh, activities get missed out. Uh, also, the, the other reason activities can get missed out is uh, and this has been captured also by this I in, in one of our articles in Agnes India in 2017, um, is that work has become fragmented over the years. If you compare across the, across the two different rounds of IHDS or also NSS rounds, uh, work has become more casualized, more fragmented. Uh, so more women are working, uh, we find, uh, compared to NSS, but the number of hours has decreased. So it's possible that women don't really fit into that 30 days norm because, because, because of the informal nature, the fragmented nature of work in rural areas, uh, making it hard to capture what gets counted as work. So uh, I think these have, these have very strong implications also in terms of um, uh, one is measuring women's workforce participation. Second, um, targeting social protection measures uh, for who's working and who's not working and, and linking social protection measures or social security measures uh, linking to, to, to women's work. Now, um, as I mentioned that social norms and inadequate in access to infrastructure can increase women's uh, unpaid work burden and this often prevents women from working, from seeking out regular salaried work. And so they're, uh, in several cases, they are relegated to working on family farms. This can be social norms, or this can be because of the heavy burden of domestic uh, work. Uh, there have been policies like Pradhan Mantri, Ujwala Yojana, and uh, several others that have improved access to clean fuel, like uh, this it, it improved access to LPG uh, with, uh, via free connection, and then there were also um, free LPG cylinders during the pandemic even for poorer family, but uh, evidence suggested that uh, 
very poor repeated uptake. So households, especially below poverty line, are not using LPG enough. Uh, women are, and the, so the households are still collecting uh, uh, firewood from the commons. And this is a very, there's a very gendered aspect of this work because women are typically uh, the water bearers. They're typically the firewood collectors. So they spend enormous amount of time doing that kind of work. Uh, so this takes time away. So there's an opportunity cost involved here uh, women, with women not being able to tap into the labor market uh, in as much as they would have maybe done otherwise. So uh, I think here what is important is, uh, you know, subsidizing the, the, the cost of LPG. Uh, the government has subsidized to some certain extent, but uh, I'm not sure. I mean, whether that has increased the uptake or not is, is something that probably the next round of IHDA survey can uh, show, although uh, initial uh, observations from the field shows that households still continue to use firewood. Um, also, if you look at like private sector provision for childcare, that is still very low. Uh, the Maternity Benefit Act, for example, mandates that employers with 50 staff, uh, at least 50 staff, should provide creches. But this leaves out those working in the informal sector, and majority of the women are working in the informal sector. So child care takes up a significant amount of time. And so that is something that we need to be able to address, uh, uh, like, you know, how to go about um, providing child care access, like reliable, safe child care access. Um, and this can be sort of, uh, uh, there they can be collaborations with, SAG networks, uh, Anganwari workers or, or, or ASHA workers to provide these kinds of uh, facilities. Uh, further, the studies have also shown that employment, and this is something very important, uh, like, and we have, we, we looked at uh, women's paid work and we noticed that women's paid work and earnings enhance uh, women's intra-household bargaining power. And uh, this, enables women to sort of opt for some of these infrastructure with the extra money, uh, they opt, they, they, then they improve bargaining power, they can, they can, uh, then this improved bargaining power sort of enables them to adopt clean fuel uh, or, or other um, necessary infrastructure, which reduces their domestic burden. It also improves uh, children's well-being. So it's not just uh, it, I mean, the, the effect is more dynamic and there are positive intergenerational gen, generational transfers. Uh, so this is something that we need to significantly think about uh, going forward. Thanks. That's Thank you sharing. so much, Pallavi. So if we uh, summarize the two presentations, Shani had begun with uh, informing us about what's happening to India's female employment in the recent past four years, it has been increasing. But then she had broken down it further at various levels to show where is it that the female employment is actually increasing. And it was in self-employment. And then she went on to talk about women's unpaid work. While Pallavi's presentation was more focused on uh, the various, the differences between male and female uh, unpaid work and in rural and urban areas. and it is one of the factor which hinders female employment further. And then she went on to talk about the different measure that is provided by the ISDS data and the DAM, DMAS, if I'm correct, uh, the second survey that they had conducted. I will now uh, invite the audience for the questions. I was seeing some were going on in the chats as my Chinese was answering. So if anybody has a question, you can just raise a hand once and then ask the question. Okay, I'll just begin with the Firdos question, which he had mentioned in the chat. He had asked Shiny, what has what happened to unpaid women workers during COVID-19 and what policy measures are needed to support SDG goals 2030? You're muted. Shall I again, shall I again answer it? Yeah. yeah. I have written in the chat box. Okay, uh, just for, uh, for to just to say that uh, uh, for those actually we don't have the time use data after COVID nineteen pandemic. We have the last time use data on two thousand nineteen, which I have already mentioned. But um, the whatever uh, official labor force survey that we have 
during the pandemic and post pandemic period is the periodic labor force survey data which shows that almost around 46% in rural areas and 58% women in urban areas they are engaged in different types of unpaid activities and if i further break these unpaid activities then within uh, within different type, within basically the two unpaid activities women were mostly involved in unpaid domestic chores but uh, during the pandemic the other different micro studies that has been carried out by definitely by ncer and by ajim premji university and also by institute of social studies trust all these uh, they have shown that women's unpaid activities have significantly increased um, <clears throat> just to say about the issc we did uh, uh, we did a survey with around 176 women informal workers uh, just soon after pandemic during the period of april may 2020 and we found that most of these women uh, these actually the women respondents from uh, five informal sectors these 176 women we interviewed they were from five informal sectors where they were the home based they were from the home based workers street vendors and the construction workers uh, domestic workers and oil speakers and we found that almost 66% of these women informal workers out of 176 they said that yeah their unpaid work has significantly increased because children were at home because all the anganwadis uh, and the, the all the child care centers were closed at that time because that was a lockdown period and moreover the other household members they were also at home so now basically who is going to cook for them it is the women it is women who are going to do that and even if at that point different uh, actually uh, through different uh, civil society organizations they are providing uh, foods and rations also it is again women's responsibility to stand in queue and collect all these so mostly all of these women workers they have mentioned that yes covid 19 pandemic and the lockdown has significantly increased our unpaid work so this is about your first part about the what happened to, to women unpaid uh, about women's unpaid work during covid 19 pandemic and regarding your second part that is the policy policy measures i would, i would again like to reiterate that yeah definitely uh, because we we need to we, we basically we need to uh, now uh, understand that yeah a huge portion of women they are working and we should recognize their work as work first in terms of our official labor force statistics statistics Uh, in terms of the suggestion i would again like to say child care support and after school child care it's not only the child care support it's like after school school child care also is important because if if we, if we are going to provide that then only you will be able to bring in my i believe that you will be able to bring more women into the official labor force statistics into the job market so a universal availability of child care facilities to all women workers as pallavi has already mentioned because we have the facility that wherever we have 50 work because we have this space facilities but most of these women as she has already mentioned most of yes fit those most yes fit those i can see you have raised your hand please go ahead yeah thank you very much am i audible yes sir yeah yeah you are actually yeah yeah you are i was just answering your question Yes, yes. I got your reply that it has increased labor force. Uh, the, uh, I can't hear you properly. Hours. The working hours has been increased after COVID nineteen for the unpaid, you know, women workers. I got it. But my question was, you know, what was the, you know, these objectives and set policies of sustainable development goals to fulfill sustainable development goals by twenty thirty? but it can in between so i i was asking do we need any you know policy initiative to fulfill the sustainable development goal 2030 as you know it has not overloaded the work for unpaid workers it had made violations against women during covid 19 because of you know lot of harassment violations at home and unwanted pregnancies during covid 19 so I hope you have not noticed. So, like to bring gender in, to bring gender equality and to reduce gender inequality, we should first uh, we should focus uh, to reduce women's unpaid care work. 
so as pallavi has already mentioned maybe we can provide better infrastructure facilities so that, uh, that women who are in, involved in unpaid and domestic and allied activities like bringing water for household uses like collecting fuel and firewood so if we provide better infrastructure facilities like uh, access to access to water uh, in, in within the household premises and then uh, if we further um, like uh, uh, put more policy focus on ujjala yojana so maybe they will be able to provide uh, they will be able to use clean fuel and to eventually reduce their burden to collect uh, firewood for fuel purposes so maybe that from the, uh, from the uh, infrastructure facilities we can provide that and to reduce women's burden in terms of direct child care work so uh, that's what i was mentioning that is maybe we can provide more uh, child care support we can open more creche facilities and uh, for all workers not only for the women who are involved in different kinds of formal employment but those who are engaged in different kinds of other unorganized sector so maybe universalized universalization of child care facilities may may help women across women workers both organized and unorganized sectors and that is basically in my opinion is the need of the award at present to bring more women into the job market thank you shreya and definitely to reduce gender inequality thank you uh, we have madhushri you have a question to whom madhushri i have two questions one is to like both dr pallavi and dr shaini but uh, the second question so i'll ask the first one uh, so women engaging in blue collar jobs like the number is increasing steadily for example as drivers or even uh, delivery workers so how can we uh, approach the analysis of the impact of blue collar jobs uh, at large and also like impact on time poverty because often these jobs tend to be very labor and time intensive and the second part to this question is that uh, is it so that these opportunities would improve conditions or open more avenues for women who have less education levels as they would provide formal employment some sort of formal employment okay Uh, i think this question was specifically about the sectors or the occupations where women are employed not as such to unaccounted work but still i'll invite dr pallavi first and then dr shaini to answer it so uh, i think you are talking about the gig economy uh, here um, and um, both gig like economy first first part was blue collar jobs and second part was yeah. gig economy, right yes. um so i i, I think uh, yes uh uh so one important thing is that what we have seen is like the recent trend has been women you know sort of leaving uh, work as from regular salaried work and sort of going back to uh, family farms so we have seen uh sort of uh more distress employment Uh, as such like right after the pandemic so it really hasn't so the blue collar jobs hasn't really absorbed women as much uh, that could be a demand based situation or it could also be an issue of skills and uh, high uh, competition um, because every, because there are also new entrants in the job market so skill acquisitions upgrading uh, you know upgrading like reskilling and upskilling is very very important um, also and and also not just training uh women only for uh gender oriented jobs but also in like non traditional jobs i think that's where we need to focus uh, when we think of skills program most of the focus has been in very traditional uh, sectors but i think we need to look beyond that and to see and and need to see what is aspirational for women so here uh, when we also think of new entrants to the labor market i think that's where the focus needs to be uh, so think about like what, what is aspirational focus on uh, vocational training uh, for women uh, so that you know uh, but also make the work environment more gender sensitive gender responsive so uh, crashes and uh, you know save women's safety public public safety so they all work in tandem these are these are all correlated factors that sort of uh, enable women to sort of join the workforce um unpaid work is what one of the issues uh so infrastructure access is important but but also these factors are are equally important in terms of gig economy um these are not really formal work because they don't really have access to social securities as such um 
but yes, they, they do provide an avenue for work. Uh, and so that is, that is still very important. Um, uh, one important thing is that I think uh, we need to emphasize more on digital skills. Um, and while access to phone have increased, access to smartphone, uh, um, there, there is still huge differences. There, there is gender disparity right there. Uh, access to smartphone between like men and and women, so it increased during the pandemic, but you know it, it sort of stopped after that. So uh, it's not as high as what we see uh, for men. So digital skills acquisition is very important. But when you when you talk about gig economy, you also need to like uh, acquisition of skills for you know entrepreneurial skills. Also for also like uh, financial literacy is very important. Uh, because you have to have, have to use the app, you have to use all these Paytm and, and other things. So I think we're, we're talking about like an array of skills that we need to provide these workers. Um, so uh, the gig economy, I think it's a very nascent stage. We see mostly male oriented uh, work right now and very few women centric work. We probably see that more in urban company, uh, which is more of an ur urban phenomena. So there's a huge untapped, uh, you know, uh, area like in, in rural sector is a huge untapped area, but uh, we need to provide the right skills. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, Dr. Shiny in brief, and then we'll have one more question. Oh, you're muted. Shiny, you're muted. Sorry, Pallavi has covered almost all the uh, possible areas. What I want to highlight is, yes, uh, this gig economy is a recent buzz and a lot of women, they are involved in these activities. And yeah, definitely got some kind of government intervention in to protect the uh, social, uh, to protect uh, the, the working hours and so that the women, uh, or even if the men who are involved in this gig, gig economy, so that they can get some kind of uh, social security that can be, uh, that maybe the that may, government may take a target to uh, highlight and to, so that these things can be resolved. And definitely some kind of uh, skill upliftment for, so that women, they can be involved, they can be employed in other non-traditional employment uh, that rather than this traditional gender stereotype work, that may be, that can be done. So that's about. We have Satwe, that's the last question we can have today. Yes, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, and. I was looking at the data. I'm not uh, an expert or researcher on your field. I saw that uh, those who are illiterate women or less educated women, they're finding themselves doing proportionally less work compared to men in unpaid and domestic work. There was uh, there were a few graphs. Like uh, when uh, highly educated women, they are doing more, like many times more than men. So what are the implications? I mean, it seems that if societies where education is less, men and women are doing more uh, shared responsibility at home, uh, whereas highly educated, if I am reading correctly, I might be wrong. And the second part, maybe a little related to both of you, is do you have opinion on the inverted U hypothesis? You know, over time, women get educated and then uh, after a few years, they're uh, held back at home uh, and then uh, things in improves, like the trophy uh, syndrome that's we, that we see uh, sometimes in India, it's picking up, but uh, has been seen in other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Shaini, you may answer please first. Yeah. So, uh, Swatik, to answer your first part, what I wanted to say is like women across all educational qualification, uh, be it the lower le le level of education or be it the higher level of education, across all educational uh, qualification, women devoted a greater chunk of their time towards unpaid care work compared to men. So it's not that in an educated family, men and women they are uh, they, they, they are uh, they are basically they are sharing the unpaid burden. 
it's not like that uh, it, it, across all level of education women they are the one who are doing this uh, greater chunk of unpaid care so what i want to say maybe may like that education doesn't appear to even the distribution of care work between indian men and women so it's what it, it's exactly the opposite what you were saying so yeah education doesn't even if uh, doesn't even the distribution of pay, uh, of unpaid care work so across all level of education it's uh, the unpaid care work is, is quite sticky and women are doing the same so this is quite opposite and uh, okay. in terms of what was your second part uh, uh, yeah yeah it's kind of yeah it's a kind of income effect yes definitely uh, the women are there uh, considered as a kind of trophy uh, so basically in, in at least in our indian culture they should be educated so that they are the better brides in terms of the marriage market but after marriage you are definitely in case of any kind in in the period of economic crisis they are basically we are considering them to supplement our household income but as soon as the crisis is over uh, we, we would again prefer to keep them within the household premises so yeah i agree with that dr pallavi yeah so uh, very interesting question and you know uh, i actually wondered that when i saw the data uh and i looked at education and the unpaid work distribution i pondered about it a little bit and uh i think it's very interesting that we see a very like you know like high i mean unpaid work is very high up for women across all uh you know uh, like all levels of education um but it's much higher uh, for more educated and low, a little lower for those who are absolutely illiterate now those who are illiterate they are also more involved in uh, distress employment or uh, in family farms uh, subsistence uh, uh, production for own consumption uh, so there it sort of gets distributed if you think of subsistence work you like it's it's family farm or animal care like if you think of animal care the work is extremely intensive so they are still working it's unpaid productive work it's unpaid economic work so it doesn't get counted as unpaid domestic work uh, as such um, so here it 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 can it's as in intensive as, as something that can take up maybe 4 to 5 hours a day uh, just if you have you know one cow and and one buffalo then bathing cleaning feeding uh, then and, and if you don't have a farm uh, if you have to go to the village commons to collect uh, the the fodder green fodder and animal feed that so, so going collecting and coming back that's two two to three hours every day so that's a lot of time away from home and that sort of provides uh, that that supplements your your income right because otherwise you would have to buy these products from the market um, so there in these cases uh, we do see some but these work probably doesn't doesn't get captured very well. Uh, these unpaid work doesn't get captured very well in labor force service it gets captured more efficiently in service like ihds uh, because we get those prompts like whether the women are engaged in these kinds of activities and how long they are working or how many days or how many hours and um in these cases men are probably also engaged in some of the household labor so there's more even distribution um but we don't see that as much when we go up the the, the education ladder uh, we see women dropping out they drop out after probably marriage um but there are there are variety of reasons one is as wealth increases uh, women tend to stay back so there's an income effect um and also whether you know with the job with the job that is on the offer is commensurate to the the household's economic status so i think whether the job is aspirational so there are you know whether the jobs with women is a big i think i think is a very important question that we need to consider uh, so the workplace has to be women friendly uh, are companies willing to hire uh, women uh, are are private companies willing to hire hire women we see more women in public sector we see more women in education but what about non traditional jobs and do women really have the skills to that so i think all these questions are very important uh, but wealth is a very important factor and then there are also some caste differentials so the the more the 
the greater the wealth, the, the greater the income, women fall out because it uh, they don't need, they don't feel the need to work. Uh, some women don't feel the need to work. And then we see this, uh, see this effect stronger for upper caste women. Uh, so they tend to work less. Uh, we don't see it as much as uh, those belonging to scheduled castes or, or, or scheduled tribes. Uh, but then there are, you know, these differences are, uh, these, these differences are stronger probably for older cohorts. Um, and maybe some of the recent surveys may, may show some, diff some, some, some different trends, which we need to explore further. Uh, but there are a variety of factors that can sort of go into play. Like when, when you look at lower educational levels and you see distress employment. Uh, and so there, maybe there is greater distribution of some of the unpaid work, not as much, but at least some maybe. Thank you, Dr. Pallavi. Uh, I think both the speakers have very well outlined the situation of unpaid and unaccounted work in India. I thank all the participants also who took time out for to attend this session. It has been greatly enriching. And thank you both the speakers. I will now stop the recording.